Well, good morning. Good morning. I am Bobby DeMine, and I am here covering for Josh, who is away today for his nephew's baptism. I'd like to welcome everybody this morning that are here, and also those that are online. We're just glad that you're with us this morning. We would love for you to greet each other in the chat section, so that please say hello if you are worshiping with us today online. If you're new, please fill out Connects cards so we better know how to serve you. Here in the sanctuary, the cards can be found in a white basket under your chair. Just fill one out and place it in the um, offering box in the back. Or if you're online, just click on the link. Upcoming events. There's a new Tuesday morning Bible study that is going to be starting August 15th uh, called Revival, Faith as Wesley Lived. Wesley's message and his faith continues to speak to the 21st century Christian, calling for a revival of our hearts and souls so that our world might be changed. The six-week study will be follow the life of John Wesley and explore his defining characteristics of a Wesleyan, Wesleyan Christianity. Wesley's story is our story and will challenge us to recover our spiritual past. Join us in room 100, August the 15th at 10 a.m. If you like to sing, you can join the choir. If you enjoy singing, consider joining the choir. Invited all who are 16 years and up to come and join the choir. No previous experience is required. Choir practice has begun and are held on Wednesday night from 7 to 8.30. If you need more information, please contact Pastor. Lift Women's Ministry Italian Night. <clears throat> Inviting all ladies for an afternoon of fellowship and fun at the Italian Oven in Peachtree City on Sunday, August the 20th at 4 p.m. <clears throat> please sign up in the Welcome Center so that we can make reservations. If anyone needs a ride, please contact either Pastor Leslie or Judy St. Tom. Ways to give. We want to thank you for worshiping with us today. If you feel led to give, you may do so through the website, mail, the office offering in the back of the sanctuary, or drop it off at the church. We appreciate your support in helping us spread the good news of Jesus' love and hope in our community. And a note on buildings and grounds. I want to say thank you to a couple of fine gentlemen that were instrumental in helping to replace some lights. Thank you. Yeah, regarding the choirs, it's uh, that call to join. It's mostly for men. All, I see plenty of men in there. We need a lot of y'all in the choir. And ladies too, but really we need tenors. Now let's come together and worship God with this call of worship from Psalm 92, verse 1 through 4. It is good. <laughs> Let me talk first. <laughs> It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithful names by night, to the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands, I sing for joy. <laughs> Cheers. 
suddenly return and never, never more the temple live. There will be always blessing. As a family of faith, let us affirm our faith together. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, word made flesh, and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified, risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. again everybody and welcome to worship it's so great to see you on this beautiful day and I also want to welcome our online friends and family that have joined us in worship today my name is Leslie Langford and I have the joy of serving as the pastor here and it's just such a great day to be here as we gather together and celebrate the love of God together we now want to turn um, our minds and our attitudes and our hearts toward a time of prayer. And in the bulletin, you'll find our prayer concerns um, listing, friends and family that we're praying for on a daily basis. We especially today want to lift up the family of Priscilla Thomas. Um, Priscilla and Larry Thomas were members of this church several years ago, and then they moved um, and became to Concord and became members of Concord United Methodist Church. Um, but they, her, she passed away on Thursday, and her celebration of life service is today at Moel Funeral Home. Visitation is at 2 o'clock, and the service starts at 3. So we want to lift up the family of Priscilla Thomas. We remember Lance and Jason and um, Renee Levy um, and all the Thomas family. And may God grant his comfort and peace to them during this time. We also want to uh, lift up and celebrate with Josh and Rosie that their nephew is getting baptized today. And as 
Bobby said that is not that is why they are not joining us in worship this morning. So um, it's always a celebration when somebody else um, comes into the household of Christ um, through baptism. So uh, we lift up and celebrate that today as well. I know that there are many unspoken concerns that we bring on our hearts today. And so we come before the Lord remembering these, remembering these persons um, in our prayer concerns page um, as we go before the Lord. Let us, let us pray. Gracious and loving God, how wonderful it is to gather as your family in your house this morning. Oh Lord, we gather to celebrate your love. We gather to celebrate your grace. We gather to celebrate your mercy. Lord, morning by morning, new mercies we see, blessing after blessing you pour out on us each and every day. Lord, we know you call us to love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbor as ourselves. And Lord, it is a lot easier to say and much more difficult to do. So we ask for your strength. We ask for you to fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we can love you and love our neighbor as you have called us to do. And forgive us, O oh God, when we fail to do that, when we fail to love you, when we turn away from our neighbor or we hurt our neighbor, intentionally or unintentionally. And Lord, we give thanks and praise today that you are a God who forgives, that we receive forgiveness and are cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so we celebrate that today and each and every day, God. Lord, we lift up those that are on our prayer concerns page. We lift up those that we've mentioned this morning. We especially lift up the family of Priscilla Thomas. We ask that you grant them comfort and peace in this time of loss, as only you can do. And Lord, we know that you hold all of our needs in the hollow of your hand, and that we can bring our concerns, we can bring our sorrows, we can bring our celebrations, we can bring anything to you. The scripture says, cast our cares on you, because you care for us. And we give thanks for that today, Lord. We pray all this in the name of your Son. He taught us how to live, he taught us how to love. And by his very example, he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Of 
Our scripture this morning comes from 1 John 1 through 10 and 2, 1 and 2. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the words of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testified to it, and we have proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has Father as appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that we, you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the message we have heard from Him and declare to you. God is light. In Him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with Him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light and He is light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, His Son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we are not sinned, if we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not only for ours, but for all the sins of the world. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable unto thee, our rock and our redeemer. O oh God, we thank you for your love. And we thank you for the fellowship that we have with you through Jesus Christ. And we ask that you be with us today and you inspire us with your spirit so that we can learn more about your love and so that we can be more loving people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, this week, as I was driving um, to South Carolina, I had to go up there for a day to take care of something, um, I was listening to NPR. Don't judge me now. That They really have some really good interviews on NPR, I think. And I was listening to this interview with an Australian journalist, an author named Trent Dalton. And he came up with this crazy, crazy idea for a writing project. He decided to spend two months in 2021 walking through the streets of Brisbane, asking random strangers from all white walks of life just one simple question. He said to them, can you tell me a love story? Now, what in the world would motivate him to do such a crazy thing? Well, it was an act of love. One of his best friend's mothers, Kathleen Kelly, someone who had always treated him and everyone she met with kindness and love, had recently passed away. And on the day of her funeral, which was standing room only, people even gathered around outside of the church because of the many lives that she had touched, including this author. When he approached his friend, Greg, to express his sympathy about his loss, Greg surprised him. He said, I've got something for you. Follow me to my car. And so he did. And when they arrived at the car, the friend opened his trunk and pulled out this sky blue 1960s Olivetti typewriter, something that was also treasured, always treasured by his friend's mother. And he said, here, my mom especially wanted you to have this. Trent was so moved by her gift, he immediately vowed to his friend that he would use the typewriter to write something special, something filled with love and depth and heart that would honor the life and love of his mom. So inspired by Kathleen's love and kindness toward him, Dalton walked through the streets talking to strangers about love, talked to him for two straight weeks, and then he sat at a desk with this sky blue 1960s Olivetti typewriter on the bustling corner of Adelaide and Albert Streets, King George Square, with a sign. And it read this, Sentimental Writer Collecting Love Stories. Do you have one to share? Dalton ended up collecting 150 stories and he published them in a book entitled Love Stories and he dedicated it to his friend's mother. And he discovered through this process of connecting people that regardless of the differences that we have as human beings, regardless of our background, regardless of our economic status, regardless of our gender or race or where we live in the world, Deep down, 
underneath the layers of our complex personalities is a willingness to believe that love can change us and can change the world. Isn't that what we believe too as Christians? That love can change us and it can change the world? Not just any kind of love, but Christ's love. It's the greatest love story that the world has ever told. Today, we are beginning a new sermon series called Let Love Lead the Way, based on the first letter of John. John, one of the twelve disciples of Jesus, witnessed firsthand Jesus' love in action. And toward the end of his life, he wrote this letter to encourage and remind the early church of what Jesus' love is all about. And over the next five weeks, we'll be looking to gain insight from John on how we can let God's love lead the way in our own lives. But before moving into the passage, I want us to take a few minutes just to recall some things about John's background, to recall his story. John, along with his brother James, were Galilean fishermen. The two brothers were working with their father Zebedee with his, their fishing business when Jesus came walking along on the shoreline that day. Jesus first called Peter and Andrew, and then right after that, he called James and John. John, along with his brother James and Peter, became one of Jesus' closest confidants. As a matter of fact, he identifies himself in his writing as the disciple whom Jesus loved, the beloved disciple. Now, I don't know why John felt like he was the most loved out of all the disciples, but my guess is that Jesus made everyone feel as if you were his favorite. Some stories in our scriptures present both James and John as rather hot-headed and having very strong personalities. And we see an example of this in a story in Luke's Gospel. When Jesus and the disciples were traveling through Samaria on their way to Jerusalem, the group ran into some trouble and resistance from some villagers when Jesus attempted to find a place to stay. When James and John saw this, they said to Jesus, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? These thunderous outbursts and others like them may be the reason that Jesus gave these two brothers the nickname Sons of Thunder. After Jesus' death and resurrection, John became a leader of the Christian church in Jerusalem, but he had to flee persecution in the late 60s A.D. Ephesus became his home, and he is the only apostle who died a natural death. All the other disciples were executed and martyred for their faith. Along with the three letters, John, of course, wrote his gospel and also the book of Revelation. After walking with Jesus for a lifetime, this son of thunder earned a new nickname, the Apostle of Love. John wrote on the subject of love for God and love for other people more than any other New Testament author. In fact, in 1 John, the word love and its relatives occur, occurs over 40 times in just five short chapters. In his old age, church tradition says that he would have to be carried into the assembly because of his feebleness. And he would sit there and repeat over and over again, little children love one another. And the Christians who gathered there to worship God would say, why do you keep repeating this? And John replied, because it is the Lord's command. And if it only be fulfilled, it is enough. I think he understood that it was probably just as hard for them in that day and time to really put that into practice as it is for us today. And it needs to be repeated that we should love one another. As followers of Jesus and as his church, we have been called to love God and love others. And that's what John points to in his letter. 
because it is what Jesus pointed to throughout his ministry to others and his teaching. He took all the 617 commandments and boiled them down to just two. He said, these are the most important. Love the, love your, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said the essence of all the law is found in just these two. Love God and love neighbor. And if there's anything that the world needs to hear and experience from the church today, I think it's the message of Jesus' hope and love. They needed, they needed it back then and we sure need it today. Our number one job as a church is to love people to welcome people, to help each other, and out of love, invite each other to come to know and experience Jesus' love too. Invite other people to come to know that, what we already know. Well, let's now walk through some of the things that John writes in chapter 1 and the beginning of chapter 2 of his letter. John writes, That which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at with our hands, have touched, that this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it. We testify to it. And we proclaim to you eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. John is saying that from the very first day, he and the other disciples were there. They were taking it all in. They heard it spoken with their own ears. They saw it in action with their own eyes. They touched it with their own hands. And they were touched by it. They saw it all happen. They experienced it and witnessed the word of life coming to earth and made flesh in Jesus. And John continues on by saying his purpose for writing this letter. He says, We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. John said, We saw it, we heard it, and we experienced it. And now, John says, I'm telling you, because I want you to experience it along with us. And just as John and the others witnessed, touched, and heard the word of life while he was present on earth, we too can experience Christ's presence in our, our own lives through the power of the Holy Spirit and experience true fellowship with God and one another. Now when we hear the word fellowship, we might first think, of fun and food. And all that's wonderful. But Christian fellowship runs deeper than that. Those things are simply tools. They're great, they're wonderful, but they're tools to bring us together to connect and form relationships. It's what happens around these tables the relationships that are formed, the support that's offered, the encouragement to one another that really matters and makes a difference. Through the love and grace of Jesus Christ, we are invited into fellowship with God and also fellowship with other Christians. As a Christian community, we're all different people. We all have different backgrounds. We may not even have anything at all in common with some people in this room. But I tell you what unites us, what brings us together, what we do have in common. And that is our love for Jesus. And that is what binds us together and bonds us together in Christian fellowship. John and the others experienced this powerfully and it changed our lives forever and it's John's hope that future generations will experience this true fellowship 
fellowship with of love of the love of God through Jesus Christ and fellowship with one another. In verse 5, John writes that the message that they have heard from Jesus and now want to pass on to us and future generations of followers is this. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. When my younger son Hampton was a little boy, he was deathly afraid of the dark. He was one of those kids that I would have to leave his light on in his room when he went to bed at night. And several years ago, when both of our sons were young, we visited the Lost Sea Caverns in Sweetwater, Tennessee. Now, if you've never been there, it's well worth it. It's this extensive underground cavern system. It's about a three-fourth of a mile walk. And they take you on that guided tour underground. And it even has this massive underground lake as well. And everything was going just fine. We were enjoying ourselves as a family. We had a good guide. They were taking us through there and pointing out all the wonderful rock formations. Then we got to the very bottom the deepest part of the cavern. And without any warning, our guide said, guess what, we're going to turn the lights out and let you see just how dark it is, how really dark it is underground. Well, my two sons had gone a little ways away from me, so I didn't even have time to react and go stand near Hampton before the lights, boop, went out. And it was the most eerie physical darkness that I have ever been in. I mean, you could not see anything. So I thought, oh my gosh, what is Hampton going to do? Is he going to freak out? Is he going to scream in terror? And just as I was thinking these thoughts, I heard his little bitty child voice echoing through the cavern, saying, Will somebody please turn the lights on? <laughs> we can feel that way sometimes, can't we? We can experience things in our lives and in the world, and it can feel like we're just covered up in darkness. And John is not talking about literal darkness. He's not talking about literal light. In the Bible, light is a symbol that represents God's nature. It represents God's purity, God's goodness, God's perfect righteousness, God's absolute truth, God's amazing and pure love. By contrast, darkness represents all the sin and evil in the world. And John says that God has no part in that. And it is this life giving love and light of God that has the power to dispel this darkness in our lives and the power to dispel the darkness in the world that so often wants to cover our world up. Only the love of God and knowledge of the love of God, I believe, can ever change the darkness in the world. John says, remember, Remember in our dark times that this God, God is light. That God seeks to enter in our dark situations, into our cracks and crevices of brokenness, both in our lives and in the world, and bring love and bring light and bring God's hope-filled possibilities and presence. John continues on in chapter 1, and he says, beginning in verse 6, if we claim to have fellowship with God and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, 
we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. We are called to be people of the light. And John seems to be saying that a fellowship that has God's love and light as its foundation is a fellowship that thrives on self-awareness and recognition of our own personal need for Jesus' love and forgiveness. John calls it like it is here. I think some of his fiery spirit is coming out. Quite frankly, he's saying here, every one of us struggles with sin. And if we don't understand that we do, we're only lying to ourselves, he says. There are many definitions of sin. John describes it later in chapter 3 of his letter as transgression against the law of God. A sin can be intentional. It can be unintentional. There are sins of commission and sins of omission. Things we overtly do and things we know we should do, but we don't do. I heard a helpful illustration of sin explained one time using the sport of archery. We are given a target of loving God and loving our neighbor. That is the bullseye that we're aiming for. But sometimes because of our human sinful condition, we take our eye off that target, and when we draw back and shoot our arrow, it flies off sideways. John says we can so often deceive ourselves. We can so often look the other way when our arrow's missing the target, but boy, oh boy, do we want to point out when somebody else's arrow's missing it. Jesus described it this way in his Sermon on the Mount. He said, you know, we have a tendency to point out a splinter in our brother's eye or our sister's eye when we have this big log in our own eye. It's hard for us to acknowledge our own shortcomings. It's hard for us to acknowledge our own sins and failures. And it is so easy to point them out in others, isn't it? But John advises us in his letter that there is a spiritual practice that we can do to help realign ourselves with God, to to realign ourselves with his will and way for our lives. John says in verse 9, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. You may have heard that old saying that confession is good for the soul. And John certainly seems to be saying that here. And John even takes it a step further. He says not only is it good for the soul, it is an essential practice in the Christian life. Recognizing our own sin and our own failures not only enables us to experience the gift of the forgiveness of Jesus, it helps us to develop humility. It helps us to be more loving, more patient, more understanding of others. Everyone we meet is a child of God, and every person we meet falls short of the standard of loving God and loving our neighbor, including ourselves. We all struggle with sin. And most of the time, we like to bury and hide it. It's just our human condition. Have you ever driven a car that's out of alignment? I... My car a couple months ago was so badly out of alignment. I think I did it when I ran over the speed bumps in the Publix parking lot in Fayetteville. It seems like they're about five inches high off the ground or something. And my car was so badly out of alignment, it just shaked. It would shake as I drove it down the road. 
the, sh the steering wheel would actually shake. And it was hard for me to just keep it in the center of the road. I'd have to fight it to keep it in the lane. And because I didn't take my car into the shop, into the mechanic, when I saw it had a problem, guess what? It cost me a lot more than it would have if I had acknowledged that problem and got on into that mechanic and said, hey, I need realigned. But because I didn't, it cost me two tires. Confession is our realignment process. It helps keep ourselves in check. Making a regular practice of examining ourselves and recognizing when we miss the mark and we're running off the path plays a vital role in growing our faith and maintaining our fellowship with God and our fellowship with other people. That's how we invite the light of God to enter in and change us. When we deny our sins and we don't bring them to God, then they continue to fester and grow and they create a lot of damage. They impede our relationship with God and ourselves and other people. Confession is how God brings us back on track and grows us to be a better people and a more faithful and loving people. John ends here by saying, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, which you know we all will, <laughs> we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. This is the great, great news. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, not only for ours, but also the sins of the whole world. When we acknowledge our sins, when we acknowledge our shortcoming to God, when we bring them out of darkness into his marvelous light, the beauty of it all is he loves us and we're a forgiven people. We are cleansed, we are set free, and that healing process can begin. And that is when we become aware of the need to rely on God and to rely on His strength and not purely on our own strength to make more loving and better choices. You know, it's so hard to do to just stop sometime and check ourselves. And we need God to help us do that. I was in Publix the other day. I went through the express line. I had ten items in my hand and I set them down on the the uh, desk there to be checked out. And as the clerk checked them out, she said, do you need a bag? <laughs> now, I would be embarrassed to tell you what my gut reaction was when she asked me that question. Am I supposed to juggle these to my car? I mean, I've got ten items here. I didn't say that. That wasn't what I thought. I cleaned it up. But anyway, we need God's strength to help us check ourselves from those gut reactions when we just want to be unkind and not so nice to the people we encounter each and every day. If we're going to live our lives the way that honors God, if we're going to strive for his love to lead the way, then we need his help and we need to commit to his realignment process in our lives. We need to confess our sin when we recognize we've sinned to him. Sometimes if we have a trusted friend in, in Christ, it's helpful to talk about our issues and our failures with them as well. And that, that is also in the scripture, to confess our sins to one another. But most of, importantly, we confess to God. And he comes in and helps realign our paths 
with his love and his will and his way. It's not just a one-time thing. It's a lifelong process. And thanks be to God, God is a God of forgiveness, a God of grace, a God of love. He was always ready to shine his light on our path when we've wandered off, when we've stumbled, when we've gotten lost, and he calls us back home. As we come to communion today, we're reminded that Christ always has an open invitation to fellowship at his table, offering us forgiveness, offering us restoration. We're reminded of what Christ went through to extend that loving invitation to us, giving his own life so that we might have fellowship with God and so we might learn to have true fellowship with one another. This is our love story as his people. And we celebrate that love today. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us now prepare our hearts and minds for Holy Communion. If you have joined us online, if you want to grab a cracker or a piece of bread and some juice, um, we would love to have you also partake in the elements um, as we um, experience communion today. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. When there was only the emptiness of chaos, Almighty God, you dared to imagine that from things unseen might come wonders to behold, stars too many to count in the night, flowers vary in color and shape, creatures that roam, flew, and swam. You made us creatures of your image to live in communion with you. We long for a relationship with you, but in our humanness we turned away. Yet you remain faithful and steadfast, calling us again and again to turn to you. For your ever-present grace and for all your mercies towards us, we join your people on earth and all the companies in heaven to proclaim your praises. Holy, 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 holy Lord, Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the the highest. Beloved, in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Supper which we are about to celebrate is a feast of thanksgiving, remembrance, grace, and hope. We come to remember that Jesus was sent by the Father into the world to assume our flesh and to fulfill for us obedience to the divine law that we could not keep on our own. By His death, resurrection, and ascension, He established a new and eternal covenant of grace and reconciliation that we might be accepted of God and never be forsaken by Him. We come to have communion with the same Christ who has promised to be with us always. In the breaking of the bread, He makes Himself known to us true heavenly bread that strengthens us in this life and for life eternal. In the cup of blessing, He comes to us as the vine and invites us to abide in Him so that we may bear much fruit. We come in hope, believing that this bread and this cup are a pledge and a foretaste of the feast of love of which we shall partake when his kingdom has fully come on earth as it is in heaven. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of the healing, life transforming acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves as holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us 
as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Come, holy God, and pour out your spirit on these gifts of bread and the vine, and on your people gathered here. May the bread which is broken give us strength to go out and choose love, not hate, to share hope and not fear, to gather people together and not divide them, May the cup of grace nourish us to be the ones who offer compassion without condition, who offer justice and grace to all creation, who love without reservation. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ and one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ come in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, now and forever. Amen. In the United Methodist Church, we practice an open table. All who desire to be in relationship with the Lord are welcome to come to his table. We have um, single-serving communion elements. If you don't feel comfortable um, still with illness out in the world, taking communion, um, with bread and the cup this way, you can take it with the single serving um, as well. We now invite you to come to the table. We'll go table by table. Um, we'll start over here with this table, and we'll just kind of go back and forth um, from front to back, from going from left to right. If anyone would like to be served at their seat, just give us a nod at the end, and we'll come serve you um, where you are in your seat. Um, so all are invited, so won't you come?
be served. Him a lot that would not let me go. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and just unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.